On February 14th, 2017, the bodies of two victims, 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German, were found near the Monin High Bridge Trail in Delphi, Indiana. The case would later come to be known as the Delphi Murders. Police recovered German's cell phone at the scene of the crime and discovered audio and video evidence. This footage was shared with news outlets with the hopes of spurring new leads in the investigation. However, to this day, the double homicide remains unsolved. In 2021, police revealed a new lead that could be what breaks this case wide open. So what happened to Abigail Williams and Liberty German on the Monin High Bridge Trail? And who was responsible for their murders? On Sunday, February 12th, Williams and German decided to have a sleepover. They were off school on Monday, February 13th, due to snow days in their school schedule. They ate pizza and watched a movie with German's older sister, Kelsey. The girls slept in late the next morning, and German's father fixed breakfast for them before leaving for work. They arranged for Kelsey to drive them to the Monin High Bridge Trail. It was part of a 10-mile community trail created by the city. The bridge was built in the late 1800s for a railway line to cross Deer Creek. It's one of the longest and highest railway bridges in the state, but it hasn't been utilized since 1980. The girls were familiar with the area, and German often went there with Kelsey to take pictures. It was a common hangout for local teenagers. German's father agreed to pick them up later. They would call or text and meet at the trailhead sometime between 3 and 3.30 p.m. However, the girls would never arrive. Around 1.40 p.m., Kelsey dropped German and Williams off at the Monin High Bridge. Kelsey noticed nothing out of the ordinary at this time. The girls walked along the trail and took a photograph as they approached the Monin Bridge at 2.05 p.m. They walked a bit further along the bridge and German took another photograph of Williams. The camera was facing back towards the bridge the two had already crossed. Both photographs were then posted to Snapchat. After these two photographs were uploaded, German filmed a video on her cell phone talking with Williams. The police have played the audio for the family and they characterized the conversation as being about quote, stuff girls talk about, unquote. The two discussed seeing a man following them further down the bridge. Sheriff Lesenby believes German began filming the video because she was concerned for their safety. The man overtook German and Williams at the end of the bridge. German's video captured audio of the prime suspect instructing the girls to go, quote, down the hill, unquote. This led the girls to a shallow section of Deer Creek, the water reaching only up to their ankles or knees. Their bodies were later discovered in this area. German's father called the girls at 3.11 p.m., but he received no response. He began searching the trails and encountered a man in a flannel shirt. Media would later refer to this man as Flannel Shirt Guy, or FSG. When asked if he saw two girls on the trail, the man replied that he only saw two on the bridge. German's father searched an alternate trail, the 505, but found nothing. Then he walked the opposite direction to a separate bridge, the Freedom Bridge, and turned back. By 4 p.m., the German family united at the park and began searching together. At 5.20 p.m., the family called law enforcement and reported the girls missing. Officials began searching almost immediately. By 6 p.m., a massive search began, with dozens of deputies, police officers, firefighters, and more searching the banks of Deer Creek. 
At midnight, Sheriff Lesenby called off the search due to limited visibility and safety concerns for volunteers. Many continued to search, including the family. At this point, police did not believe foul play or criminality was an element in these disappearances. Around 12 p.m. on Tuesday, February 14th, search party members found a shoe underneath the Monin High Bridge. Kelsey confirmed that it belonged to her sister. It wasn't long until their bodies were discovered just a half mile away from the end of the bridge. The crime scene was rumored to have been bizarre and disturbing to law enforcement officers who arrived on scene. Recently, the former Indiana prosecutor Robert Ives released some details in a podcast interview. He said when compared to a typical crime scene, there was a lot more physical evidence. He claimed that the scene contained at least three signatures, although he did not elaborate. He also said the crime scene was non-secular in nature. However, he also said the scene could have been staged to trick investigators. Police claimed to have recovered DNA from the scene. However, specifics on the type and source of that DNA have not been released due to fear of jeopardizing the investigation. Some speculate this is a bluff by police, attempting to drive a confession or create leverage in future interviews with suspects. Lesenby has been criticized by some for his initial handling of the search. By canceling at midnight and failing to preserve the area, the integrity of the scene where the girls disappeared became contaminated. This meant that any future physical evidence would be polluted providing plausible deniability to any suspect implicated. The following pieces of physical evidence were confirmed to have been recovered from the scene of the crime. One piece of evidence was found by search party members, a shoe, while two other pieces of evidence were discovered by police. Found an item of interest under the railroad bridge. Girls undergarments. <laughs> have a cigarette butt. In the water, that is less than two or three days old. The exact location of the bodies is not known, but some early journalists photographed the scene while the area was cordoned off. A neighbor indicated in this picture where the bodies were found. Autopsies were conducted, but the results have been sealed because this is an active investigation. On July 27th, 2017, police provided a sketch of the primary suspect. State Police Sergeant Kim Riley told news agencies that the sketch was a composite of the information collected from all involved agencies. This sketch would be replaced by another on April 22nd, 2019. Officials would claim this new sketch more closely resembled the suspect. In a press release, Police would clarify these two were separate individuals. Strangely, this newly released sketch had actually been completed just a few short days after the victims were found. While stills from German's video had already been released to the public, the police shared a one second clip on April 22nd, 2019, and they confirmed the unreleased recorded footage did not capture the attack on the two girls. Additionally, an updated snippet of audio was released on April 22nd, 2019. It can be heard here. Superintendent Carter stated during a press release that police were seeking assistance from the public in identifying a vehicle that was parked at the old CPS DCS welfare building. The vehicle had reversed into the parking spot, hiding the license plate from view, but it was in the area at the time of the murders. This concludes the review of officially released details between the Indiana State Police and Federal Bureau of Investigation. There is one unofficial source, a leak within the Indiana State Police. 
This individual created a Facebook account under the pseudonym Lee Kerr, an aptronym as she was a leaker in the investigation. Kerr began to release additional information on the case through Facebook, some corroborated and some not. The following details are unofficial stemming from an unverified leak. The primary suspect was believed to have participated in the search for the two girls. His name was on a list of participants. When his DNA was found in the area, his participation in the search provided him with plausible deniability. However, the only DNA found on the girls was familial, belonging to her older sister, Kelsey. Unreleased audio from German's phone reveals that the killer had binoculars, handcuffs, gags, and a hunting knife. Some of the unreleased audio includes the suspect telling the girls they are trespassing and he can't let them cross the bridge again. He tells them that they are under arrest. Clues from this tape indicate that both girls were detained and Williams suffered blunt force trauma to the head. There is no clear indication of what weapon was used during this assault. The murder weapon was likely a hunting knife due to lacerations on both bodies. Kerr stated there was an obvious signature. The girls were posed in a quote, sexual tableau. It's uncertain what this would mean when combined with statements from Robert Ives. How could the scene be a religious sexual tableau? Kerr stated that a small clump of hair was removed from each girl as a trophy. According to Kerr, the police have a primary suspect. She claimed that his cell phone pinged in the area near the CPS building. Kerr implied that no arrest would come from this case unless an identification was made from the second sketch. Lee Kerr has been a polarizing figure in this case. Some claim that she is a fake, pretending to be a confidential source for attention. Others claim her information has been validated, especially given recent case developments. As a result of police withholding information about this case, speculation has been rampant and tip lines have been flooded with theories and persons of interest. In January 2019, Charles Eldridge, 46, was arrested in the area after a cyber sting operation. Eldridge had an illicit conversation online with a police detective posing as a 13-year-old girl. After his arrest, his mugshot was released and the police department became inundated with calls. His mugshot closely resembled the 2017 police sketch. Police reported receiving over 30,000 tips after Eldridge's arrest, and they warned the public of reporting tips based solely on appearance. However, they investigated Eldridge anyway. He was reported as spending inordinate amounts of time in the woods, dressed in fatigues. He was reported by those who knew him to be very violent. Through the cyber sting, it's clear that Eldritch was a predator who targeted young girls. After his arrest, authorities and journalists reviewed two Facebook pages operated by Eldritch. Disturbingly, he had shared multiple posts about the Delphi murders. No further information has been released on Charles Eldritch and his potential connection to the Delphi murders. Paul Eder, 55, owned a farm eight miles away from the Monon High Bridge. In 2019, he abducted a woman as she pulled into the driveway of a friend's home. He took her to his farm and assaulted her before she could escape. Police attempted to detain Edder during a traffic stop, but he fled the scene. This resulted in a car chase and eventual police standoff, which continued for five hours until Edder took his own life. One detective reported that Edder was likely not at the top of the list of suspects. However, investigators took a DNA sample from Edder but the results of this test have not been released to the public. 
James Chadwell II, 42, was investigated for the Delphi murders after his arrest in a separate case. Chadwell kidnapped and brutally assaulted a minor in the basement of his home, and he was convicted in October 2021. Chadwell is a felon with a long criminal history and a previous arrest in South Dakota for aggravated assault. His recent indictment indicates that he is also a predator who targets young girls. Some have referred to the tattoos on Chadwell's arms as resembling Abby and Libby. Chadwell's brother indicated that he did not have these tattoos after his last prison release, suggesting that it could have been done after the Delphi murders. In a recent interview, Chadwell's brother said, quote, He's a monster, exactly. He's an absolute evil person. Do I think that he's capable of that kind of crime? Absolutely. Unquote. Kerr predicted that Chadwell would be cleared for involvement in the murders in November. She said that investigators would be developing a new investigative angle. And shortly afterward, a news network released an affidavit and the police released a statement on Keegan Anthony Klein. On February 25th, 2017, just a few weeks after the murders, the FBI executed a search warrant on a property where Keegan Anthony Klein and his father lived in Peru, Indiana. Six tablets and cell phones were seized during the execution of this warrant. Keegan's primary phone was not seized until two days later, after he had already run a factory reset to wipe the data from his phone. In an interview with police, Klein admitted to creating fake profiles on Instagram and Snapchat to speak to underage girls. One of these accounts was named Anthony underscore Shots. The account used photographs of an Alaskan male model, and the postings attempted to convey a luxurious lifestyle. This was one of the accounts used by Klein to solicit images from underage victims. With his catfishing accounts, Klein communicated with underage girls and solicited sexual images and videos. These images were uploaded to Dropbox and shared with another party. However, the identity of this individual is not known. These cloud services run something called Photo DNA to search for explicit images of underage subjects. However, images are not screened when uploaded they are only screened when shared. For this reason, it's likely that Klein shared the login credentials of his account, rather than sharing links to images. The Cyber Crimes Unit investigated all confiscated devices and uncovered additional catfishing profiles with illegal images and videos of juveniles. Many of the images recovered from these devices contain metadata revealing the location the photograph was taken. Overwhelmingly, these images were from local areas within Indiana. This could suggest that Klein was after more than just photographs and videos, that he wanted to meet these underage girls as well. He was not arrested until August 2020, three years after the confiscation of these illegal materials and after the Delphi murders. The affidavit indicates that Klein is clearly responsible for operating the Anthony Schatz account, but police have requested that anyone who communicated with this account to come forward with additional information. It's uncertain how Klein is connected to the Delphi murders, but some have speculated that he shared images or information about the girls, resulting in their murder. While police continue to pursue leads and identify suspects, criminal profiling will likely be a critical tool for officials moving forward. By examining key details, they may be able to determine characteristics of the killer. In press releases, the police indicated that the suspect is familiar with the area and the murders were about exercising power for pleasure. The suspect targeted two victims in public in broad daylight. This illustrates overconfidence or overestimation in his abilities and his desire to demonstrate power. 
Worryingly, there is nothing stopping the killer from striking again.